like me. I hope everybody is uh, healthy and safe. These are difficult times, and these are difficult times, especially for marketeers. Now, I was uh, lucky enough, blessed, I would say, in my career to see marketing from many different perspectives. Uh, so my bachelor's, my MBA, my PhD, they're all in marketing. Um, and uh, my academic career, how I started uh, my professional career, was, of course, in marketing. I was doing um, um, classes, but also academic research uh, in marketing. Then I, 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 I was lucky enough also to see marketing uh, through a consulting eye. So I was a consultant to CMOs, CEOs, UFOs, many different, uh, many different professionals concerning uh, marketing strategy and brand strategy, both small and big companies all around the world. And um, uh, at around 2009 and 10, I joined as a chief marketing officer, um, um, a big uh, retail management company in Southeast Europe, which was a merger between Mary Lynch in the US and a local company. So I also had the opportunity to see marketing as a CMO. And after that, I created my own um, branding, branding strategy company, a boutique company, small one, around five people in Southeast Europe. Then we merged with an advertising agency. We created a middle-sized advertising agency, around 40 people, a few millions of, um, of um, revenue. I was managing director in the, so also in the crazy advertising um, arena, which I spent a few years. Uh, and then I went back to academia. There were many interesting things I wanted to study. And for the last um, two and a half years, I'm the CEO and the founder of a startup in Southeast Europe. Um, uh, called Trisma Neuro. We are based in Belgrade. Um, we are an applied neuroscience company. This means we do a lot of neuromarketing work in more than 25 countries. We have measured more than 5,000 brains around the world of how the brain reacts to marketing messages and marketing efforts. But also we do um, something which is a little bit even more scary than neuromarketing, which is NeuroHR. So we use the same technologies, electroencephalogram and eye tracking and uh, skin response and face recognition within the company to test how um, skills, competencies uh, are uh, created and developed within companies. So um, all these experience, I try to summarize them in two books. My, the two books that I co-authored, the first book is uh, Neuroscience for Leaders, which came out in 2016. It went very well globally. And now it's in the second edition. We expected the Although the second edition has been announced because of the virus will be postponed the launch, we hope by the end of summer to launch the second edition. And my second book is Advanced Marketing Management. Um, both books are for Kogan Page London, a major consulting publisher in the world. And this second book is going to be the base of what we're going to discuss today. Actually, it took myself and my co-authors more than 10 to 15 years of collecting materials, thoughts, strategies, cases, to put this book together. And we wrote this book out of sheer disappointment of current textbooks for master level students. I'm teaching in MBAs for, I would say, uh, 17 years now in MBA uh, classes around the world. And the textbooks, I always found them as fine to provide some basic knowledge, but then I used to, I had to use many specialized um, um, books from different, uh, different areas in order to create the right learning experience. So I decided um, this should be actually summarized in one book and we wrote Advanced Marketing Manager. So let's start. We have a lot of things to say and I hope you will find it very interesting. Okay, let's start with this. Guys, what the fuck? What the hell is happening with marketing for the last 20 plus years? We go from a one crisis to another. Maybe some of you are very young, maybe some of you are my age, and maybe you remember the dot-com crisis in the beginning of the 2000s. Maybe you even remember, I remember this as a young academic, 1998, um, seven, eight, the collapse of uh, the Asian markets and the effect that this had in the whole world. So there was a lot of financial crisis discussion then. It started with, um, uh, South, uh, Southeast Asia, then it went up to Russia. The whole world was discussing crisis, how crisis will affect business, how crisis will affect uh, marketeers. And then right after we came a little bit out of this crisis, we went into the dot-com crisis, which was a crazy crisis because companies just were investing heavily on, on dot-com companies. You know, there were, there were funds and investors 
you know, pet.com, a very famous case, where we thought that the world will be completely different because of companies online. So companies that were buying generic names like pet.com and providing um, pet uh, products and services online, they, 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 they seemed like the new world. So everybody was excited and investing in this. And of course, this was a big bubble that passed. And everybody, you know, people lost their jobs. Um, um, a lot of layoffs, companies closed down, um, a, a, a big mess. And again, what marketing should do? Where did we go wrong? What kind of stories we were saying that, that we didn't follow or we didn't check if they were real or not? And then, of course, we go to the uh, 2007, the, uh, the, the financial crisis from the US, 2008, then Europe, 2009, 2010, big crisis. Uh, again, budgets go down, people are laid off, brands are, are doing soul searching to see you know, how they can contribute in this crisis. Then we come out of, of this crisis and 2020, coronavirus crisis, which seems to be as big, if not bigger than, than any other. And of course, I'm not adding all the types of crisis in this story, right? I mean, we have disruptive events that could not be characterized as crisis, but they push the story thing, what marketing is and what is our role in companies. And what is the portfolio of skills and the methods we have as marketeers to deal with, with the new world, like technology, social media, digitalization. And then you have other types of, of, of crisis, regional crisis. You know, the world in some countries might be quiet for the last 20, 30 years, but in other countries, the world has been very turbulent with existential threats, okay, like in Ukraine. Okay, so we, we, it seems that, that we live in a constant state of crisis it might be it might be a big crisis and then some normalization period but this normalization period is as normal you know or uh, uh, normal as far as the next crisis starts so i think our mindset as marketeers should be a crisis mindset even when this crisis passes some people predict 18 months okay until until we decisively win the battle with coronavirus this does not mean that after that will be, as I remember in the 2000s, there were people that were talking about the, the eternal growth period and an economics period that will never have crisis again and will manage to deal with everything. And of course, this is a, a big fairy tale. It's wishful thinking. It's at a very dangerous one at that. So it seems that, as I said, marketeers should always have a coming crisis in the back of our minds. And now we have a very real one to deal with. So, here we go again, guys. Crisis again. Let me maybe move this a little bit to the left. Here we go again. Another crisis. Let's see how to deal with this and maybe what kind of things we learned from the previous crisis that will make us better as marketeers. And of course, the brands that we are managing to survive and why not to grow and thrive within it, especially after, after the crisis. So my, my talk, will, will um, I separate it into three, three um, steps, three periods. One is the past, the present, and the future. Concerning the past, I want to share with you some I find very interesting and amazing um, slides that I had prepared back in 2009 to deal with the crisis then. And you will see how much uh, important and timely they are even today. Also, we will go to the present and we'll try to understand a little bit better the situation, some numbers of what is happening today. And also in the present, we will see some of the actions that brands are taking. I made a category. You will see some categories of, of actions, some groups of actions. I label them even of how, what seem to be the initial knee-jerk reactions of, of brands to stay alive and um, declare themselves present within the current crisis. And the future, this is the most important, that I have a lot of materials there. I don't know if we will manage to finish today. Maybe we'll make, make a, a part two which I'm going to focus on empathy, on empathy as a strategic choice of companies and brands to deal with the crisis. And empathy, we will discuss both from a scientific view, don't forget I'm, a, I'm an applied neuroscientist, so we actually study empathy inside the brain, but also very practical in companies. We will see some examples there as well. So let's start very fast because I really want us to reach the future, okay, today. So let's go and talk about the past a little bit and see, see what we can learn. And maybe and the most important, are we still doing the same mistakes? Okay, so look at this amazing, amazing statement. So um, Jean-Claude Laresh, a, a marketing professor um, said back then, 
And he had a very famous book, if I, if I remember correctly, it was called Momentum. And then a very famous book in, in European academic marketing circles, and then, of course, in, in practitioners. And look what he said back then in, in, uh, in The Marketeer, the UK um, CIM magazine. He said, for decades, marketing has behaved like an athlete hooked on performance enhancing drugs. It has grown reliant on ever increasing budgets to feed ever more extravagant promotions rather than relying on creativity and genuine customer focus. And he says, well, this crisis will take the drugs away. So in his statement and in his studies and consulting career, he noticed that we marketeers are a very strange bunch. We always need more money to fuel sometimes crazy ideas, which are sometimes successful without relying in the best possible data. And then when things do not go very well, we say, ah, what can we do? I'll show you the, the, the typical excuse of marketeers in a bit. So marketing looks like this a little bit, okay? <laughs> we are, we, we are, we are in, in, in normal periods or in periods of economic growth. And I remind you that as between the dot-com crisis and the 2007, 8, 9 crisis, people were talking about eternal growth and budgets were going up and stock markets were going up. The same happened from 2009 till now. Dow Jones um, in the US reached um, record highs a few months ago. So we are, were living from 2010 to today in the Western world, of course, not everywhere. There are always, as I said, geopolitical crisis localized, but we were living an unbelievable growth period. So budget, money, finance was not the problem. Actually, even companies were keeping cash afraid, being afraid from the previous crisis in huge amounts inside the company. There was a report that um, Apple was, um, was um, uh, had more than $200 billion in cash in the company just in case. Hedge funds as well, investors as well. So the, the market has one, even today. There is a lot of cash. This is why the current crisis is not the same as the crisis in 2007 and 2008. There is a lot of cash still in the banks, in funds, in the companies. Of course, we might say this might run out, but the problem now is not cash okay, for the company. So all this period, we had putting money in effort. Before, there were probably uh, lavish advertising campaigns. Now, there are lavish digital campaigns. And if you think, because I'm sure many of you think, but Nikos, digital saved the day. We have data. No, it did not save the day. In, in the advanced marketing management, um, we have a lot of data and statements by major marketeers that actually between 2007, 2008, 2006 were coming out and said the promise of digital, of online marketing, social media, and digital marketing was not delivered. Actually, many top CEOs from top brands confined with uh, Sir Martin Sorrell. Sir Martin Sorrell used to be the, the CEO and founder of WPP. WPP is one of the biggest globally uh, conglomerates of marketing ecosystem. You know, WPP has advertising agencies, research agencies, digital agencies, PR agencies, um, any media agencies. It's a whole ecosystem of how marketeers can operate with, you know, the major partners. And he said in 2017 that I'm, I'm meeting with CEOs of, uh, of my top clients and they say that actually digital did not deliver. It was a great promise. It was a fantastic thing, but it, it didn't bring the spring in marketing as we should. So it's still, we are in, 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 in uh, enhancing drugs, like a performance kind of stuff. Before it was more, mostly for, for ATL campaigns, from 2010 onwards was on digital campaigns, but still results were not en masse there. Okay, and look at this. Um, this is a fantastic statement by Steve Johnson. He said, marketing seems to be like uh, perfuming the pig. What does he mean? Uh, many companies are perfuming the pig. They build a product that people don't want, and then they try to throw some marketing on it to make people want it. Now, we, as marketing academics, researchers, are as, as you know, deep 100% to, to marketing, we understand that marketing is not only advertising. Marketing starts with a very product, with your idea about the product. Market, uh, marketing starts in the market, understanding deep, deeper needs. Fine, but this is not in the, in the marketplace. Most people, even many marketeers, still believe that marketing is mainly communications and reaching out to the client and communicating and engaging with the client rather than the whole marketing process of 
the backbone of whatever the company is doing. So marketing is perceived, and there is data proving this, global surveys, that prove that marketeers, the budget of marketeers, is mainly thrown for promotions. Regardless if you are a B2C or a B2B company, even B2B companies, most of the marketing budget is for, let's say, trade promotions, online promotions, participating into, into fairs and exhibitions. So regardless of what we send, what we wish marketing to be, marketing budget proves that marketing is more, unfortunately, communications. Or if you remember this four piece model, promotions. Okay? And this is true. This is, this is unfortunately very true. We, even, even startups now know this, and digital startups online startups. Uh, some engineers have some great idea about the product, about the service, about the solution. They try to develop the code to test it, etc. And marketing is to, to, to hack growth, you know, growth hacking marketing. It's about spreading out as a virus, no pun intended, spreading out as a virus and catching fire and everybody using our product. Okay? It's, it's a later stage, unfortunately, effort. And also, uh, another interesting um, statement is when people talk to themselves, it's called sanity. If you, if you see some people walking down the street talking to themselves, no earplugs, no phone, you will say this person is crazy. But when companies talk to themselves, it's called marketing. And this is one of my favorite statements because it touches the key problem of marketing. Marketing, regardless, again, how academically and theoretically we want to say it's an outside in philosophy. We start from the market and then we come in to see how to shape whatever we do to fit, even to drive market change, fine. But it's unfortunately inside out. A lot of the things we do from product ideas to um, the prices, to promotional efforts, to advertising messages, they pass through so many tick checking lists that the end result is not what really customers want is what we want to say, uh, what our CEO wants to hear, what our shareholders are comfortable for us saying, what our employees are okay to produce, and not really what the market wants. And that's a big problem of not being able to experience and deliver the true spirit of marketing. Okay. And the last one by Professor John Qualls from Harvard Business uh, um, School, he, he said that, uh, let me take this down, he said that uh, unlike accounting or other professions, marketing is not a real profession. What does he mean? He, he meant actually that I cannot just walk by um, um, uh, a court of law and come in and say, hey, I want to defend somebody, you know, to stand up and be a lawyer or a, or, you know, or, a, or, a, or a judge. I have to have specific qualifications and specific certifications, specific training. That's not the case with marketing. This is what he meant. Everybody can be a marketeer, which one hand is good because we bring always new blood, new ideas, and fresh thinking, fresh mindset, that's fine. But on the other hand, there is no standards. So actually he said that marketing is as art as science, as much as right brain as left brain. And I think this is the excuse of marketeers. This is the key mantra of marketing through not only crisis, but in normal periods of work as well. When we have a campaign and it's fully successful, we achieve all goals. We overachieve. We say, wow, it is our efforts. It was our plan. It is our team. It is our skills. It is our brain, our clever. We're so clever and smart, we did it. When campaigns don't go well, applying the same techniques, applying the same methods, applying the same process and methodology and the same brains, what do we say? Because actually, if we apply the same approach and it fails while previous succeeded, then it means there is no science. We cannot replicate what we do. So what is the knee-jerk reaction, the defense mechanism to, to gap this cognitive dissonance, you know, this difference between the reality and intention is to say, ah, no, don't shoot me. Marketing is half science, half art. You know, of course we can calculate some things, but who can predict? Human beings are unpredictable. So this was our, our mantra that, you know, give us budget, give me budget. And regardless if digital or not, this is so true in digital even today. As much as you give me money, this money will be used 50% scientifically and it will be used 50% artistically. Do you see how crazy this sounds? Do you see how CEOs are so um, negative about marketeers? Because we don't sound professional. We sound funny. 
And this is the effect. In every crisis, and this is from the previous crisis, and in this crisis as well, I will show you some numbers. Which is the budget to be cut first? Which is the first budget that company cuts? Marketing budget. Second, HR. Hmm? Both deal with people. So if we are so clever and so important and so uh, fantastically efficient and effective and we know our, uh, we know our craft, we are, we are reliable professionals, why it is our budget to be cut first? One, this means there is no trust. This means they don't see results. And they're right. They are right. Okay. And not only this, why 80% of CEOs do not trust marketeers? 80% global study, 80% of CEOs do not trust marketeers. 91 of CEOs trust finance and IT. Who's to, who's to blame? And this is within the digital area eh, um, period and era. It's not before, it's now. Why they don't trust us? Why marketeers? And of course, I've seen many marketeers and I've done this myself. I don't blame anybody else myself. I want always to find excuse which is, you know, I, uh, on the other people. No, no, it's your mistake. You don't get it. You do everything right. This is rubbish. This is rubbish. We should see ourselves in the mirror and understand the mistakes we have been doing because this crisis will be even more severe on marketing and we might survive after the crisis. Okay. Also, yeah, take a look at this. Who stays more in marketing posi in, in positions in a C-level? So in the C-level, you know, CEO, CMO, CIO, UFO, we said, all these people. Who stays more? Look at the average tenure of a CEO is eight years. Eight years a CEO stays in his or her position. Look who is last on the list. CMO, 4.1 years, when the average is 4.3 years. Why companies change marketeers more often than any other C professional? Hmm? Recycling marketeers. Why marketeers cannot reliably and predictably stay in a company revered and be considered a valuable, indispensable, irreplaceable asset, and rather the company is changing them very often? Whose mistake is it? Hmm? And we, <laughs> we kind of admit it. There is, the, the CMO position is an um, electric chair position. It's a very difficult position, probably the most difficult position in the company. And there is, you know, many people that have studied this and come out and say, yes, the CMO position is a problematic position. And who's to blame? One of the things that why this is a problematic position, you might find interesting, is the fact that whenever there is a, there is a new CMO coming in, he or she, the first thing that they do is they change everything. They change agencies, brand position, um, uh, strategy, everything. Why? Because they want to show that, listen, there is a new kid on the block. I know better. I bring my ecosystem. I have to be comfortable. Now I will show you how it's done. And of course, most of the times fail. Okay. And look, look, at, look at digital. Now you have all heard, of course, of digital transformation. And digital transformation has been the number one buzzword in business for the last five years. Every company had a business transformation 2020, 2022, 2025 vision. Everybody wanted to become digital. And of course, digital transformation does not only mean digital marketing. This is one part. It means business models. It means strategies. It is much a more complex concept than just marketing. Who should lead digital transformation in companies? Which C professional? And of course, marketeers would say, we. Who in a company deals with customers? Who in a company, because digital transformation, regardless its complexity, the key goal is to become more competitive and more fitting in the new environment by using all these wonderful technologies. And fitting in the market means marketing. We are the ones that listen to the market. We are the ones close to the customers. We are the ones, we, we are the ones um, uh, uh, like a, a radar trying to establish the reality through and, and study the reality through competitive analytics and all this. We do the, the, the studies, the surveys, the research. We collect data. We track our brand online. We should be marketeers. Many people should say marketeers. Reality, look at this. When it comes to digital transformation, the chief information officer isn't always the leader in charge. What does it mean? Is it marketeers? No, it's not. Often there is possibility shared with the organization data, digital, innovation, and technology chiefs. Actually, there was a study by a guy called Solis last year. Actually, I think he does it every year, a digital transformation state of affairs. And last year, and I shared this on my social media, he said, unfortunately, marketing lost. 
up to 2008, if the CMO or the CIO would lead this transformation was rather close. From 2009, CIOs, technology officers, bypassed marketeers as leaders of digital transformation. They don't trust us guys. Of course, there are, there are exceptions. Of course, there are exceptions. There are always exceptions. And very important ones. But marketing department is losing the game. So who owns digital transformation? Surveys say CIOs. And this is from CMO <laughs> a website. Okay, so even we marketeers, we understand that we lost the game. We lost the game of digital. We could lead it. We could be the top dog. We could finally, we could finally embody the dreams and the hopes of everybody in the company that marketeers will not just be specialized professionals. We will not just be marketing department experts. We will not just be click-through rate experts. But we will be leaders for the whole company. We will help the whole company, all the departments, the CEO, understand and transform the company into a new model. We, that we understand the market and customers better than anybody else. We lost it. And we lost it, unfortunately, predictably. I was not surprised that we lost it. If you study marketing through the previous crisis, you will see that we don't learn. On the contrary, we jump in the wagon of every new trend, any new buzzword, any new hype, spending a lot of money trying that we will be winning awards and clever and nice and you no. Know, but the essence is unfortunately different. So this was the past. Let's move into the present. So is the corona crash worse than the 2008 financial crisis? There are many people that say, yes, this could be, it has the potential. Of course, it's very difficult to predict. Huh? Our predictions are very easy. I can make many predictions, but 98% or 99 would be wrong. So it seems that this crisis will be worse financially. Depends on the duration. If somehow a cure or a vaccine is found fast, maybe it will not be as big. If it takes, as I said, 18 months, maybe it will be one of the biggest crises we saw since 1929, the big financial crisis that started in the US. Okay, so we should take it very, 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 very seriously. And already uh, marketing budgets are being cut drastically, um, even online. Uh, there are whole industries that are collapsing, um, travel industry, uh, food uh, service and hospitality industry, uh, retail, apart from food and drinks, but fashion is collapsing. So you see that there is a lot of industries that used to be big spenders. Entertainment industry, you know, now Hollywood studios, they don't know what to do with the movies. What are they going to do with the movies? They cannot be released in cinemas. They're, they're thinking of starting releasing them on their digital platforms, you know, like, uh, like Disney+. Plus. So instead of the new Marvel movies, being launched after the crisis in they're actually thinking of launching them now digitally because what are they going to do with it? You know, they have a pipeline. So there are huge industries that were traditionally being big spenders in marketing that are, have no industry action. Okay, of course, uh, and you see other effects. In, I'm, I'm seeing every single thing get canceled. Influencers are getting canceled. Celebrities are getting canceled. Celebrity culture is collapsing. I don't know how many of you saw my last um, post online. You can go on my LinkedIn and Facebook and find it. Celebrity culture is collapsing. Have you seen the celebrities singing uh, Imagine, uh, John Lennon song? How awkward was this? How awkward and clumsy effort of celebrities to feel like they're still present in our culture. No, they are not. They are like a luxury fat that when you have to be lean, it has to be cut to stay only the crucial core of what you do. And this is happens also with influencers. When everything was fine, we had the luxury to pay attention to people that actually just a little bit entertain us. And many times with funny slash stupid slash inconsequential you know, comments. And this is now canceled. We go down, and this is my post was actually saying, is your brand a celebrity? Is your brand self-indulgent, overspending, fluffy, image-driven, online conversation-driven brand? Or is it a brand that the core functionality is strong, is needed, 
and you change this core functionality to fit the real needs, the real fears and pains of people today. That's a big difference. You have to cut the, the celebrity part of your brand and to go back to the basics. Of course, not everything is down. The crisis, as every crisis, favors some aspects of marketing and some aspects of the um, marketing and, and, and companies, right, of the economy. So you see news, gaming, e-commerce ad spending goes high up. Sales of supermarkets go high up. Online buying e-commerce of supermarkets go high up. So of course, in, as in every situation, social, economic, you don't have the whole thing collapsing. When the whole thing collapses, you have some parts of the economy, some strategic importance one going up. So I paint the story of really this crisis being the worst, but this does not mean that it affects every aspect. There are some aspects that, of course, not only will remain, but even will go up. And we have to see what we learn from that. Now, this I found very interesting. This is the, host, the 100 uh, fastest declining categories. You see that luggage and suitcases, briefcases, cameras, car, uh, uh, outwear, swimwear, <laughs> who will go to, to swim, anti-theft technology, uh, cell phones. Cell phones decrease of 40%. On cell phones, okay. Um, very interesting, very interesting uh, thing. And of course, the hundred um, fastest growing brands. You will see that bread machines, bread machines, increased six hundred fifty-two percent. Okay. So of course, there will be some uh, aspects both of marketing uh, practice and industries that will go high up. So how brands are taking extra precautions of go coronavirus? Is it? Now we, as marketeers, are the ones in the driver's seat of the brand story, the brand position, the brand strategy, the brand interaction and engagement with our target audiences. What do we do? How do we react? You see that many brands are very cautious. They are very slow and they are extremely hesitant to take a stand. And I think this is very wise. We should not jump, although there are many people, and I have to say, especially digital marketeers, that they scream, now is the time, let's take a stand, let's talk on. This is very dangerous. Many of these digital marketers are very young. I'm not sure even they lived professionally the previous crisis. So they only see the last 10 years, the flourishing of digital online conversations. And they think this is the only reality that exists. No, it's very dangerous time for your brands, as you will see in a bit. We have to be extra care. We should not be knee-jerk reaction to, to contribute as we were contributing when things were nice. You know, when things were nice, your brand was posting every Monday morning a nice positive picture on your Insta, on your Facebook page saying, hey, good morning, it's Monday, it's a great week, hi everybody. No, 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 this is very superficial, very low risk, very low impact, who gives a damn? Hmm? Now, if you say something that is out of context, that is not taken well by the market, the risk is very high to damage strategically your brand. So it's good that brands are taking slowly to see. And don't, don't forget, we are only a few weeks into the problem, I mean, mainly one month in March is in the Western world. We have to be extra care and not do something that sounds cool, sounds legendary, sounds contribution of a brand, and that's a celebrity. Guys, who cares for our brands? Nobody gives a damn for your brand. Is your brand providing better, easier, uh, improved functionality and conditions for me to survive through crisis? This is what I care. I don't care you coming out and singing, imagine all the people. So great that brands are taking it. Now, I wanted to show you an example. Now, let's hope that this will, will play. This is an example of an ad of a brand, a Ford, which actually is considered rather positive online. It was received um, positively. And it is one of the examples of, of something that the marketeers produced, which was very careful, was very to the point. I will show you this ad, and then we will go to see how, what is the portfolio of reactions, of let's call them tactics. I'm not sure it's so much strategy. They are tactics of brands today. Okay, and you will see which ones you, you think they are more valuable than others. But let's watch this and see what, how careful and how um, mindful was the Ford team, marketing team, in order to produce this. And the marketing team was not alone. 
This is not only the product of marketing, because how it will end, it will show you that what they're trying to say goes deeper than just a message. Okay, let's hope this will play. It's directly from online. You see, this was a, a, a great example. Let me just go try to move. Yes. So this was a great example of not only a company very simply. Did you see some celebrity? Did you see some uh, salesperson, some actor, some slice of life, some fanfare, some uh, uh, um, glittery dust that we, you know, perfuming the peak? No, very simple, very to the point. It shows that Ford went through many crises, always trying to help. Uh, the American people, and most importantly, very simple, very, very wise, very subtle, but most importantly, at the end, you saw that the ad was by Ford Credit Department, and the ad was about, and this is what it said, it said, Be if you are influenced, if you bought a Ford car, and you cannot repay because, you know, you lost your job, you have to, you know, pay your mortgage, uh, you don't have income, contact us, and we'll try to make it easier for you. That's marketing in crisis. Marketing in crisis is not, hey, good morning, we will all make it, fantastic, woohoo, celebrity stuff. Abandon this, abandon it as, as fast as possible. Go to the real pain of your customers and try to see how to help the real pain of the customers. Be useful, be, be creatively innovative. Find simple solutions to support them in these very great challenging times. Now. I, I kind of, um, of um, uh, um, summarized the ways from which companies um, uh, react to this crisis through marketing strategy and tactics, okay? And uh, you can find some of them in the Fast Company article. I have it here. Uh, we are all in this together. Why brands have so little to say in the pandemic, okay? So it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting article. And um, it summarizes few techniques. I expanded them and I added some more. And this is my understanding of how um, brands are now reacting to the crisis practically. Okay. And I identified uh, five major strategies and tactics. If you identify some more, please let me know. Okay. It would be nice to have this link list growing. Um, and I found this... Uh, I mean, inspired by the article you see on the screen, um, five major ways to respond to the crisis. The first one is communications focused, communications driven, image inspiring, um, celebrity uh, driven. So here we are just communicating. We put posts, we put ads, and we try to sound heroic. We try to sound uh, socially sensitive, but it's just blah, blah. We will all go, we sound like politicians, you know, everything will go fine. We will be here the next day together. Humanity is strong enough to go through. We managed before. So empty words. And these empty words is unfortunately, I mean, if it helps anybody, fantastic. I'm not against it. If anybody gets inspired, I'm all for it. But unfortunately, this is the least that people want now from brands. Okay. The most is further down the list. Second, it's process focused. This is where companies, and that has been done already, companies coming out and saying, we are improving our processes. We are trying to adjust the situation and offer you a more safe product. A very notable example mentioned also in the article is from pizza delivery companies, pizza delivery companies in the US, very famous brands, where they say, listen, because of the crisis, we take extra care. These are, listen, these are, the tangible ways by which we have improved our process to ensure that you get, when you get your delivery, it is, it is um, healthy, it is coronavirus free, and we do our best to both serve you what you want and to minimize the risk of spreading the virus. Fantastic. This is process driven, internal driven. Then we have production focused reaction. Louis Vuitton masks. Uh, eye shield 
uh, Apple announced last week that they will produce masks for medical, medical um, personnel in order to work in their very difficult um, position that they are now and not get infected. Um, so this is actually a, a reaction by which your company uses its production or if it is outsourced or if it is partnering network to provide real products and services that help deal with the corona today. Okay, it's actually product and service oriented, but focused within the challenges, the health challenges of corona today. And I said, there are many examples. I think even uh, now I, I was watching uh, last two days that many auto manufacturers, um, uh, car manufacturers, they come out and they, they transform part of their production line to help the nation go through the crisis. Fantastic. Uh, third is support focused. Support focused is what Ford did here with uh, trying to ease the conditions for you repaying your loan. So we are making it easier for you. Um, we are not um, delivering pizza so we clean you know, better the, the, the production process. We don't have production to produce sanitizers and masks, but you know what? You have a mortgage with us. You have a payment plan with us. You have, a, you have a, a payments due at the end of the month. We understand the difficult times. We will make it easier. We will uh, make more payment, um, more uh, better payment conditions. We'll be more flexible. We, we might even cancel some of the payments and, uh, and uh, take them to the future. Okay. And the last one, the last way, and of course, each of them are not mutually exclusive. Companies uh, can do more than one at the same time. Donation focused. This is when companies and many celebrities also did this, which I think is fantastic. Finally, something good from celebrities, but also brands. What they do is they say, I, um, I donate part of you know, my um, resources, could be people, could be money, usually it's money, to this cause. So I donate $1 million or euros to this uh, hospital or to this um, lab to come up with a faster solution. So these uh, five main umbrella approaches. The communications, blah, blah, we are here for you. Process, we are improving inside so we are safer for you. Production, we offer uh, specific solutions to fight the crisis. Um, support, we make it easier for you because we feel your pain. Donation, we give money to support the cause. Okay, as I said, if you have any more to add or examples for each one, I would be very happy to receive. Okay, so let's move to the future now. We have around half an hour to discuss about the future. And my view about the future, as I mentioned in this post online, is empathy related. Now, empathy should not be considered only a promotional trick, a communications technique, an engaging online discussion tool. This is empathy at the very late stages. Empathy should be strategically reconsidered and embedded in the marketing process in all aspects of marketing. Actually, I will show you a couple of models of this towards the end of my speech. So specific models and methodologies where, where empathy can fit and how. Okay, but before we understand how to use empathy as a tool, and I'm sure this is what you care a lot about and we will reach that. I want to start by presenting what empathy is because unfortunately, as many other things, empathy as a word has been misused and misused quite a lot. And I have to say also as a marketeer that marketeers are not the best when it comes in having a deep understanding of, of these kind of concepts. I understand we are extremely under pressure. We are in the spotlight. We are the ones to be called to react in a crisis and try save customers or say something to the customers, perfuming the pig, to keep them with us. We are in extreme pressure and thus we jump on the wagon of every new idea that comes out regardless if it is a good idea or not. I understand this. This comes from our stress. It's even humane. Okay. But unfortunately, this crisis, as the others, are pushing us to change, are pushing us to be more serious, more strategic, more not only marketing ex experts, but organizational wide enablers of change. Okay. So before we, we discuss empathy and how it works in the brain, I want to show you a very simple concept that comes out of, um, of research. 
Uh, this is called the social cognition model. It's one of the best models that psychology and um, neuroscience is offering practical model to understand how the brain works when it encounters and interacts with a person or of a brand. Now, mind you, our brain has not developed a separate part to deal with brands. We have the same brain for tens, some say 100,000, some say 10,000 of years. Do you think that because we have a brand phenomenon of 100 years, all of a sudden we have a specific brain part devoted to, brain, to, to brands? No, we don't. Actually, many studies have shown that for our brain, a brand is a person. So the same networks that our empathy networks, as these ones that you'll see, our brain um, um, engages when it meets a person. Would this person be my friend or just work or just an acquaintance or I don't want to associate with this person? The same, these, the same brain networks also are engaged when the, the, the person interacts with a brand. So the first thing that I ask all the brands that I, I advise and I work with is, is your brand a real friend to your customers? And they say, Nikos, what do you mean a real brand? We, we are business. Of course we try to help, but we are a business. I said, then their brains will always consider you as a business, always, which means you want your profits. You know, it's, it's a zero sum game. You want profits, I want something else. Maybe it's not a win-win situation. Only if you understand that the brain uses the same love, care, connectivity, social interaction, loyalty, networks that engage when we have a best friend, uh, our favorite person, uh, part of our family that we love is the same brain network that will engage when we interact with a brand. So this social cognition model has found out that there are two major characteristics or criteria that our brain engages, puts into action when we deal with somebody in order to then understand and decide our brain, what is going to be our approach? Will it going to be a positive or a negative? And it's called the warmth and competence model. You can find it in books like Compelling People, um, Presence, The Charisma Myth, um, Olivia Fox Caban added one more. We have it in our book, Neuroscience for Leaders, and The Human Brand as well. These are books and models that I, are explained in um, uh, my book, Advanced Marketing Management, that I showed you in the, in the beginning. So what does this model say? Very simply, it says that when the brain sees a person or a representation of a person, which is a brand, okay, uh, engages two criteria. First, the first one, in milliseconds, the brain prioritizes this, is warmth. Warmth. What are the, your intentions towards me? Do I understand very fast through things that I see, how you speak, the words you use, the images, my past experience, do I detect that you want the best for me, that you are on my side, that you are there to help me practically, tangibly, and realistically, then warmth is high. Did my, brand, did my brain understand that your brand actually just want profits? It's just a superficial communication machine to sell something to me. It's actually only looking by the, the best for itself and doesn't care about anybody else. Then warmth is very low. So the brain first will, will use warmth, and then after it decides on warmth, will add competence. Competence is, are you good in what you do or are you bad in what you do? Now, the best possible outcome for our brand is for the brain of our customers to decode our efforts as warm and our capacity as high competence. Then the brain engages in the best possible motivational way. It, it has a positive motivation in engaging an approach motivational um, um, network, as, they, as, as we call them in the brain. And it wants to interact with us open up to us, trust us, and become loyal to us. The worst position is, of course, if warm is low, so my, the brain of your customers consider you as not a good person for them, not with a good will towards them, and low competence, that you're also very good in what you do. Now, my problem is that, apart from marketing communications, that, as we said, is superficial, and the brain does not prioritize. Actually, you, you know, why do we have this phrase? Actions speak louder than words. So regardless of what you say on your social, social media accounts and posts and nice and funky and interesting is what you do. So regardless of what you, you say is what you do that matters. And the brain understands this. Okay. So these two are the criteria. And unfortunately, as I said, companies engage more in warmth, in spray, spraying, perfuming the pig, nice, 
fluffy, interesting, warm in communications. But when you call the call center, you wait 10 minutes, you, you hear a robot, actually you hear a person having a protocol and behaving like a robot and an awful lot of situations. So when you interact with brand, it sounds like low worth, regardless the promise of the brand story, okay? And um, we prioritize a lot of competence, you know, to be efficient and effective and the ERP systems and the latest technology and all this, and we, and we forget warm, we forget warm. Even we marketers don't, marketers don't understand how important and strategic and deep warm is. And there are, there are studies that have put various brands within these two criteria. Uh, for example, there is big discussion with this. So maybe we'll do a number number two. But there is a way to to study your brand and see where it is in this in these um, two criteria. Uh, this is in Europe more. You will see um, the World Care Organization. I don't know now because of this crisis because this, this is a few years ago. The research you see that all banks are in the worst position, <laughs> apart from Banco Santander in Spain, but all the others. Um, Deutsche Bank, HSBC, BNP Paribas, ING, they're in the worst quadrant, okay, et cetera, et cetera. And what is important is that you will see that uh, warmth has a better explanatory power to project, pr uh, purchase intention, loyalty, or likelihood to recommend, you know, net promoter score. Warmth is more important than competence. And this is because, as I said, the brain, uh, time-wise, first engages warmth, and then decides on competence. So warmth always comes first for the brain, okay? And you will see also something extremely interesting that if you want, for example, to explain um, purchase intention um, of, uh, of a brand, you will see that warmth and, warmth and competence, this social cognition model explains a higher percentage of if I will buy or not than, for example, familiarity and demographics. So if you're using familiarity, brand awareness, brand like ability, all these survey questionnaire based or interview based um, methods. And um, you have also demographics, you know, you do uh, now in digital marketing, we are obsessed with profiling, profiling and personas. But this in the end does not explain much of what consumers do. I'm sorry to spill the beans. I'm sorry to shatter the, the nice story we built for ourselves to get money from the CEO but it doesn't. The most important is warmth and competence, and it happens with brand loyalty as well. And you see here, for example, that if you ask people if they're satisfied, they're happy with the product, but also you measure how connected they are because of warmth, you will see that warmth, which is the, the uh, brown, the, the brown uh, bar, explains, predicts much more of all these phenomena than any kind of feedback mechanism we have, okay? And before I move into specific, um, specific um, empathy measures, apart from this basic model that I want you to understand of how the brain works, okay, is that uh, this is the time to address customer pains. Of course, you all heard, and this comes from neuromarketing. Neuromarketing first discovered this, that uh, customers react faster and stronger in pain points rather than in pleasure points. How much do you know about pain? as a professional, as a marketeer. Digital event, by the way, the event marketing industry is collapsing drastically because we cannot make events. Digital, of course, which is fantastic. How much do you know about pain? Whoever taught, taught you, taught us what pain is. So we, we are so easy to say pain. And then we have a questionnaire saying how much you, you like this or how much you don't like this or how much you care about this. And we try to make some, there are some marketing research models about pain. Really? Really? So superficially, that's it? We no pain? So I wanted just to introduce you a model that I found in my ignorance. Huh? I found um, through psycholo psychology theory that actually there are different types of pain. And these, they are discussed in the fantastic book, The Other Side of Happiness by Brock Bust. So there is physical pain, there is emotional pain, there is social pain, and there is existential pain. Okay. Now, if we go, I'm not going to analyze this different seminar, but I, I just wanted you to, to show something that should provoke us to go more in depth before we start talking of how our brand helps you in your pain. Okay. So there are physical pains, and there you see the, the, also the relation with the equivalent pleasure. And you will see that warmth, warmth, is the first pleasure, positive 
um, uh, that is mentioned in the model. But I'm not going to stay here. I just want you to focus on social pains because I think that many people now, because of this um, physical isolation, the fact that we, can, we have to stay at home, it has been termed um, uh, social distancing. Maybe it's physical distancing because still we can socialize online. Okay, um, a very famous neuroscientist called um, David uh, um, Richard Davidson, he actually came out and he said it's not physical, it's physical distancing, it's not social distancing. We can still retain social relations, which is great. Uh, you will see that the main social pains is loneliness, rejection, loss and failure. And you will see that which are the equivalent pleasures, so how to fight it. So loneliness with social connectivity. Is your brand and your brand platform transformed into a platform to connect people in these difficult times without necessarily selling anything? Are you enabling them social, social connectivity in a period of physical isolation? Rejection, many people stay at home and feel rejected from their friends, from family, from you know, the, the things that they used to say. So acceptance, loss, reward, failure, success, and even maybe deeper is existential pain, fear of death, loss of meaning, fullness in life. The fact that maybe we, we feel that life has no meaning because I cannot go to work, I cannot go out, I cannot see my friends, I cannot go to the cinema. Um, many people in many podcasts come out and say, you know, even therapists say that many people ask the question, who am I? Who am I? What am I? We're losing the meaning of life. Okay. So we have uh, 20 minutes to discuss hardcore empathy. First of all, empathy is losing in the West. There is what we call the empathy deficit. Even Obama mentioned it. In 2006, Obama came out before he became become a president, and he said, we live in a very self-centered, inward-looking society. Everybody tells you, you know, you have to be richer and uh, uh, look better, you know, more beautiful and uh, more with higher status. But we don't talk about empathy deficit. The fact that we cannot so easily, we lose, we are losing the natural ability of the brain to understand and connect with other people, to try to share their, their feelings with us, to try to connect with them and to try to help them. So this is called the empathy deficit and it, and it looks like this. You will see that it's dropping since the beginning of the 90s. Okay, and this is really a pity. This is really a pity. The empathy, warmth that we saw earlier, is a major, um, a major aspect of a healthy brain, of how our brain evolved to be social animals of the ones we are. We have become too egocentric, too centered to our own needs. You will see that if you, if you want more on this, you can go to my previous post online, which I talk about the prediction about this actually since late 19th century, that our society will become very individualistic and there is some reactions to this. At the same time, when empathy is falling, what is increasing? Narcissistic personality. So uh, the more we lose empathy, the more empathy goes down, narcissism goes up. Of course, there are many new techniques to understand this phenomenon. I will show you one. It's a, it's a difficult algorithm. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going to, to take much time. I just wanted you to be aware that there are very um, heavy, heavy um, uh, scientific methods to understand this phenomena. The latest one is called selfie per hour. So how many selfies do you take per hour? This is a great indication of a narcissistic trait. <laughs> and of course, we used to take selfies outside of home. If, if we still take selfies inside home, imagine how much narcissistic we, we have become. And of course, it's not a joke. Indeed, there is academic study linking a lot of our social media behaviors, how often we change profile pictures, what kind of posts we put in, and they correlate, there's a correlation between this and low empathy and high narcissism. Okay, scary stuff, but unfortunately true. And there is studies even globally, the World Economic Forum is trying now to understand how companies are um, uh, dealing with empathy. There is this, um, the empathy index is controversial. Many people have atta attacked it. So I just want to show you that there are now efforts in a global level to also understand how empathic are companies. Are they doing well with empathy? Okay, I would dispute this, but it exists as an effort, okay? And this is the main problem. We marketeers are awful in empathy. There are studies like this one, like this one by Johanne, Johannes Hatula that found a study for more than 400 marketeers 
on their level of empathy. And these researchers found out that marketeers, especially marketeers in companies, are awful in connecting mentally and emotionally with their customers. Surprise? Wouldn't be the opposite? Shouldn't be the opposite. Shouldn't marketeers be the ones that are connected? We have our hearts and minds open to connect with our customers. And research shows we suck. We suck in connecting with our, with our customers. Okay. So there are three types of empathy. I will do this very fast because let's say this is the hardcore science of empathy. Uh, we use empathy as one thing. Neuroscientifically, though, empathy is not one brain reaction. There are at least three empathy networks and empathy reactions, neurological reactions, that uh, can be described as empathy. And only if you understand all three, you will see how to apply it in, in the, your company and your brand. Okay. So three types of empathy. These are the three types of empathy. There is cognitive empathy, there is emotional empathy, and there is compassionate empathy. In my applied neuroscience company, we test the first and the second, and we are now developing a protocol to test the third as well. It's a bit more difficult the third, but we are getting there. Okay. So what is each one? What phenomenon each one describes? Because they are different. Okay. And there are different actions related to each one. The first one is cognitive. Cognitive means, do I mentally, analytically, consciously, I am aware of it. Do I, if I see somebody, if I see a post, if I see some behavioral data, people buying this, don't buying this, etc. Does my, does my brain allow me to have a, a concrete idea in my mind of what this person is thinking and feeling? This is not subconscious, it's not unconscious, it's not intuition, it's actually effortful thinking. You see, Dan, you say, hmm, what does this data tell me? Why this customer said this? Why did this consumer group said this? What does this analysis say? Aha, it says that my target group is thinking these thoughts and feeling these feelings. It has many names like perspective, taking theory of mind, stepping into somebody else's shoes, it, I'm saying again, this is the conscious, rational, analytical aspect of empathy. Is you taking data from reality, analyzing this data, and coming out with an insight, a solution of what other people might be thinking or might be feeling. Okay. Now, I, I want to do a test with you to test this, to see if your cognitive empathy is strong today. Um, can you please all, although I cannot see you, I will trust you will do it. Can you please all place your finger on your forehead? Can you place your index finger in the middle of your forehead? I don't know if you can see me. Maybe you can see. I hope you can see me. So if you place your finger on your forehead like this, can you please draw, draw on your forehead the capital letter E in English or E, hmm? elephant? So can you draw the capital letter E, elephant, E? Draw it on your forehead. You have to draw it from starting from here. Capital letter E. As I said, the starting letter of elephant, E. Good. So there are two ways to do it. How many did it like that? Or how many did it on the other way? Can you please tell me which of the two ways are actually more empathetic. Think about this. Which of the two ways is more empathetic? You will actually realize that if you drew the letter E in a way that other people can see it, this was an em empathic or empathetic is the same word, reaction. Because you care about how other people read it, not you. If you drew it in a way that you only can read it, as if you read it, then your empathy is low. You care how you read it, how you understand it. Okay, so don't worry, it can be improved. Okay, <laughs> even if you drew it as a self-centered, this can all, our brain is plastic. That's the hope and the positive message of the day. So, you know that the people that, um, um, there was a very interesting study that asked people to read some letters. 
some of these letters were very self-centered, like I'm the best, I, I know everything, I'm very valuable, I'm the indispensable member of the team, just a very self-centered, I can achieve everything, blah, blah, blah. And some other people read some neutral letter, you know, nothing about biological processes. And then they ask them to draw the E word, the E letter. You know what happened? The people that read the self-centered letters drew a self-centered E three times, 300% more than the people that were reading the, the neutral letters. This means that empathy is not rigid. It's not is there or it's not there. We all have empathy networks, hopefully healthy and alive. Is how our, our brain or ourselves help empathy to express itself or how in science it's called inhibit to stop empathy. So the more egocentric, the more self-important, yes, yes, I'm a superman, superwoman, we marketeers, yeah, the best team, oh, we'll take over the world. Then 300% more, you draw the E like you would read it, not the others. This is a great indication of how you can help your empathy networks to increase. Actually, I think this is why the, the Hatula study that found that marketeers do not have empathy is because maybe we feel too self-important in the company, I think. Maybe we think that we're the most clever, the most important people on the team, on the total. So, so this was cognitive empathy, emotional empathy. Emotional empathy has to do with if, now this is not um, conscious, is not analytic, is not thinking, it's feeling. When you see somebody's crying, do you cry? When you see somebody angry, do you immediately get angry? If you see somebody sad, do you experience sadness so you can approach them? This is very important. This is the key of bonding. Our human brain feels warmth towards people that experience the same emotion as we, we experience unconsciously, without thinking, intuitively. It's called also mirror affection, emotional synchronization, emotional contagion, like virus, etc. This is it. If you see a picture like this and you feel like you, you got the hit, you know, like say, oh my God, this, this, is, this shows that your brain is strong in emotional level because we immediately internalize, internalize without thinking automatically the emotional state or physical state for that matter for the other person. It's, it's because of mirror neurons. We have neurons that fire up when we see some other people doing something and they fire up as we are doing it. Okay, this is very interesting. Uh, last uh, 15 years discovery in neuroscience. The last one is compassionate empath empathy. And I'm going to go fast to show you some examples. Um, empathic concern or behavioral sympathy. This is where you don't think, you don't feel, you just help. You don't analyze data. Hmm, no, no, no. You're not saying, oh, I, you cry, I want to cry. No, you see somebody crying, you jump up to help them. This is behavioral. And this is what I want to show you. The empathic brand understands cognitive empathy. So understands the others through cognitive empathy. You have the data, the research, the neuro, the, the neuro results, the surveys, the net promoter score, the face-to-face -face discussions, and you have all this data to analyze and to understand better the, the cognitive and, and um, emotional state of the other person, understand, not feel, understand. Okay, so this has to do with data analytics. Uh, emotional empathy connects, and this has to do with customer experience, when a customer comes through your touch points, every touch point, physical experience, uh, call center, online, getting the product, do they feel that you felt them, you understood them, you ease their pain, you, you boosted their pleasure. Okay, what we have been discussing before. And the last one is support. Are you there to help them now? Are you taking actions tangible to make their life easier like what we, we saw with, with Flow? So um, cognitive empathy is about data analytics. Emotional empathy is about my experience when I go through your, your, my, my customer journey with you. And the third one is what tangible actions you take to help me now. Okay, so I want you to show, to show you this example. At Southwest Airlines, we're united by a purpose. A purpose that is at the heart of everything we do. It's the simplest and purest expression of why we exist. Our purpose at Southwest Airlines is clear. We exist to connect people to what's important in their lives through friendly, reliable, and low-cost air travel. 
This purpose is why we get up every morning and why we matter to the millions of people who fly with us each year. And if we live this purpose every day, we'll achieve our vision to become the world's most loved, most flown, and most profitable airline. But it all starts with you. to go to the airport for my husband to be deployed for six months to Kuwait. So when we got to the airport, we were sure we weren't going to be able to go past security with him. We would have to say goodbye. So I saw him walk up in uniform and I just, I saw a whole bunch of family members standing nearby. So I asked him if he was being deployed and he said yes. And I asked him if they all wanted to go to the gate with him. And he said, yeah, that'd be great. So we were very happy because that bought us about 30 more minutes for us to spend time together. But once it was time for him to go on the plane, we had our moment. We hugged and said goodbye. Um, the kids did really great. I was holding it together. But we wanted to stay and watch his plane take off. One of the Southwest employees came over, tapped us on the shoulder again, and said, can I please do something for you? Thoughts in the back of my head were, what can you possibly do to make this any better at this point? I realized we had about three to four extra minutes before the scheduled departure time. He stepped away for a moment, made a quick phone call, and came back and asked if the kids and I would mind coming back on the plane. So we were very excited. The kids ran down the tunnel. When we got to the end of the tunnel, they called out on the intercom that there was a John Chatelier on the flight. And we saw my husband's hand go up in the air and the kids were able to run to him and give him one last hug. And the amazing part was the whole plane cheered and everybody was real excited for us. So we got one last moment with him before they closed the doors and the plane took off. It was a touching moment and I mean, all the passengers started clapping and everyone was tearing up. When I talked to him when he had landed in Kuwait, he said that that whole moment, that experience, made him realize that people were going to be watching out for us, watching out for him, and just taking care of us overall. So the, there is another, uh, there are a few stories there which are very interesting, but we don't have the time to see all. I just wanted you to show you the first. Now, Southwest Airlines is a very peculiar brand because although it is a low cost airline, and you know, low cost airlines in Europe, we think about Ryanair, EasyJet, uh, Visa, and, and Visa, and, and we think that these companies are, are, you know, they offer very low or different customer experience, you know, because they have to save money. So we kind of, allow them not to have the best customer experience and the most lavish and luxury experience, but very basic because we get um, cheap tickets. But, but Southwest Airlines has a fantastic customer experience being a, a low budget airline. And they do this to their people. And they do this to their people and their em empathic responses to the pains of the customers. And they empower their people to do it. Now, Southwest is in the US is a company with one of the highest loyalty scores of, in every industry higher customer satisfaction scores in every industry, higher net promoter score in every industry, every industry in the, in the, U, in the US, okay? So they are, although a low cost company, and this is the myth, if you are a low cost, you cannot have good loyalty, empathy, you know, this kind of things. No, if you are low cost, it doesn't have to do with your brand, your, your, it doesn't have to do with your product, your price, it has to do with how you interact with people, okay? And I want to, to um, um, contrast this, with a competitor and how a competitor is not empathetic at all. Okay, so take a look at that. Talk about turbulence. United better fasten its seatbelt. Attacked on Twitter, bored as a doctor, leave as a patient. We put the hospital in hospitality, parodied on late night. If we say you fly, you fly. If not, tough. <laughs> and we'll drag your ass off the plane. This movie clip from Airplane has taken off. Oh. <laughs> Everything's ready. The word of the week is reaccommodate, as in we can reaccommodate you the easy way or the hard way. Getting ready to fly involves bubble wrap for man and man's best friend. The captain has turned on the no passenger sign. Most of the online slings and arrows came via the hashtag new United Airlines mottos. Mottos like we have first class, business class, and no class. You have to admit that's a lot of leg room. 
United Airlines introduces new cabin class, Fight Club. And check out the reimagined safety instructions. Please cover your head and brace yourself for a beating. Old commercials are being turned into mashups. Performing together with a single united purpose. what makes the world's leading airline there are parody ads from other airlines southwest we beat the competition not you and an actual real ad from emirates airlines mocking united with its own slogan and this became comply with me and you know this will beat you so badly you'll be using your own face as a flotation device. United is now the one taking a beating, and it's the internet that's unfriendly. Genimo, CNN, New York. So you see the difference. You see the difference between the two cases. In one case, and of course I understand that the first video is, is produced by the company itself, but the, 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 the scores of Southwest in all major marketing uh, measurements is extremely high, okay? So they have data to back it up. You see a company that is low cost, but it really cares about its employees and especially about the customers and using empowered employees to deliver empathetic reactions to problems. While you see a company like um, United that uh, they had this case where the uh, plane was full, you remember this case? They had to take some passengers out. One, one didn't want to go out and they called the police. They took the guy out. Actually, they, because of the force, the guy um, uh, was, was um, hurt, he had blood. I mean, you see the mess. And you see clearly how a company can um, be empathetic or be completely uh, empathy blind. And, you know, you might say, yes, but um, what about if a problem comes, if a real problem comes? And indeed, Southwest experienced a problem in one of its landings in a plane where the, if you remember, the window, um, the window actually blown out was um, destroyed and the, uh, and the lady sitting next to the window, she was half drawn out of the plane. They managed to put her in, to, to drag her in, but she died. How should a company with high empathy react to this? Talk about and indeed, um, Southwest reacted in a very empathetic way. First of all, they understood the problem. They connected emotionally and they did something practically. Immediately after this, they offered $5,000 to all all passengers, be careful by saying that if you accept my 5,000, this does not mean you cannot sue me. If you want to sue me, please do. And I also offer you another thousand as vouchers to fly because I understand and we're very sorry, we'll do everything, contact our center. So they did all the actions to prove that they're close to you. When things go wrong, when things go wrong is when empathy is needed the most. This is why the crisis now is when you should turn up the empathy to maximum. Okay, so what does it mean now? A couple of practical things and then maybe we'll have the, the chance to answer to a few questions. So there's a book called Empathetic Marketing by Mark Inigver. Uh, it's a very interesting book because um, there uh, Mark is um, defining six major drives, uh, motivational drives from customers, uh, their needs, let's call them a very important needs. And these are the needs that we as marketeers, we have to incorporate in all our marketing activity, not only communications from product and service itself. Let's go fast through it just to get a, a flavor of how we should be there, what kind of help we should be giving to our, to our which are the inter internal strong drives, okay? So need for control. The question there is, are you putting your customer in the driver's seat? D does the customer feel empowered? Does the customer um, uh, um, ask? Um, does the pa customer participate? Become a member of the team? for solving problems, developing products, uh, creating solutions for the market. Needful self-expression. Are your products enabling customers to express their own individual self-identity? Is it all imposed to them? Is it all imposed? Or it recognizes the need to be an, a, a person with a specific identity. Need for growth. This is, this is key also for how the brain works. The brain is not there to help us only survive. This is an old idea that the brain is also there to help survive. No, it's also there to help you thrive grow as a person, as a family, as a team, as a community. And the brain is very strong about the need to grow. So how is your brand, your product, your service, your, the customer experience you provide, allow them to grow as people and develop? Need for recognition. Are your products and services personalized? 
Okay. Need for belonging. Are your products instrumental for caring customers connect? You remember the one of the of the main social pains is isolation. Okay. Now, especially today, experienced because of the crisis and the physical distancing. Need for care. Are you demonstrating genuine care, warmth, genuine care? Not um, our, our department will call you, fill up this form. Are you there really for them um, tangibly and demonstrably? You know, it's very easy to demonstrate. So I want to give you an example, another example of a company that um, applied um, a new model of marketing approach. In our book, Advanced Marketing Management, we a little bit updated the old four P's model. You know, if, if you ever had formal marketing training, four P's are product, price, place, and promotion. Okay. And we updated a little bit. And we said the empathic product. Okay, the empathic. So it's not, the product is not only what you do and then you sell. The product should solve these six needs and the pains I discussed before. The product, not just the communication. Okay. And there is one company, um, and this is, this is uh, the company you see, Decium, that actually uh, is a global example uh, in my view and the co-authors, but also in the industry that it belongs, that they revolutionized marketing. And it's a cosmetics company. And you see here an article from a few days ago, from March 18, saying Decium fueled the skincare boom. Then it almost went bust, and now it's again back up very much. So maybe you've seen these products. The Ordinary is the main brand. This actual brand uh, of Decium um, um, represents 80% of their sales. Look, it looks very interesting, yeah? like, like a chemical, like a laboratory product. It's, it's um, it really, it changed the skincare industry forever, okay? Um, I think 2013, Decium was established, and then a year after they issued Ordinary. Now, um, I just wanted to show you this because um, it is really amazing that the company reached 330 million in sales. A, a, a part of the company was bought by, um, by um, Estee Lauder as a new and upcoming amazing brand in cosmetics. And you will see up there that in several years, they changed completely how people buy. You know, very important. It allowed the new generation of consumers to understand ingredients. Empowerment. You remember empowerment? Participation. More radically, offer them ridiculously cheap, cheap formulations. It championed transparency. Go back to the needs that we discussed. In an industry that wants you to think expensive products are better. And an industry where inviting me, the guy that, uh, the person that um, wrote the article, a reporter to poke around in the skin samples and see how formulas are made of. Really, it was, they opened up the whole company trying to understand what people deeply need and offer the best possible marketing mix. And this is the guy behind it, Brando uh, uh, Truex. Unfortunately, he died here yeah, last year. Um, he made a video a um, few years ago, I think 2017, where he said, we are going to revolutionize marketing. He says, there is no marketing campaign. He says, anymore. I'm not going to make any marketing campaign. Uh, I'm going just to speak to you through social media, truthfully and open about everything in the company. He hired and fired people online. He connected with suppliers online. He talked about his products and competition online. Not with this rigid political, uh, perfuming the pig, a beautified uh, way of communication, you know, brand guidelines and, uh, brand, uh, and, 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 and brand models and brand uh, guardians. It was no, as a human being to human being, remember what we said for the brain? The brain doesn't have another part to connect with brands, uses the same as people. And he was genuine and true. Unfortunately, he had some psychological problems. It's really a pity, but maybe it takes atypical people to create atypical marketing. And we all typical people, we create typical marketing. Okay. So this is, this is an example of an empathetic marketing mix of Decium. You will see the product price, place, and promotion, and they worked to connect deeply with the needs and pains of customers in every element of the marketing mix, in product. The packaging and the name of products were very straightforward, scientific looking, not over, not over beautified. Simplicity, direct approach is trying to be more true, uncomplicated. It actually educated the customers about the ingredients. It, it, it actually, there was no, you know, this um, nicely designed package with nicely named, nice uh, imaginative names. No, actually, it was the ordinary and said the percentage of each of ingredient that has fantastic stuff. Unheard before, like it's a B2B company. 
they were behaving like, and that's a clever. You behave to your customers as professional buyers, not as lost and easily swayed consumers. Okay, price. They lowered their price. Uh, they placed. They were everywhere available. Uh, they made their own flagship stores. I visited the one in uh, Covent Garden in the UK for my wife. Okay. Um, promotion, uh, as I said, the communications were very true, very real, person to person, uh, the face behind the brand, and not, and not beautified creative ideas from creative agencies. Okay. And um, this is actually something that I would like to finish with. Um, and this is the three empathy levels you can use in your marketing efforts. Uh, I separated empathy on strategic level, tactical level, and operational level. In strategic level, you have to go in and see the purpose of your company. You all know Start With Why eh? by Simon Sinek. Is the why of the company dipped in empathy? Does it radiate empathy? Or is it to become the biggest, the stronger, you know, like we, have, we had the corporate uh, vision and mission before, you know, old stuff. Your values, the culture within the company. You saw from Southwest Airlines, empathy is not an advertising trick. Empathy is the culture and the values of your company inside. Corporate citizenship, as we called, said about don donations and trying to help society go through the crisis. Are you a good corporate citizen? Tactical level. This now we go down to the specific brand portfolio. Is your brand story? Is your brand position? Is your brand portfolio, brand, not bread, I see the other. Is the portfolio, is the brand, uh, the, the, the genesis, the creation of the brand empathetic? Does it, addresses, does it address the six needs that we said? Does your brand, do your brands deal with the pains of your customer? And the last one is operational. This has to do with every interaction that the customer has with your company, all the touch points, customer service, sales efforts, Online communications, as you saw also from Southwest, when the people, you know, the family had a problem, the father was flying to Kuwait and they were sitting outside and crying. And then the Southwest employee said, do mm, you want to go with them to the gate just to prolong how much? That's amazing. This is empathy. This is connecting. And when they went to the gate, the other guy said, do you want to go in the plane and hug your father before he flies? And everybody clapped. Empathy is so strong. It's so important. The network for emotions, for connection, okay? So strategic level, tactical level, and operational level. I'm finishing with my last recommendations, advice, okay? How do you start after everything we discussed today? And it was a long journey, a lot of things. First step, don't do it if you're not sure. I think what we saw before as companies, brands being very skeptical and slow to react, I think this is wise. Of course, if, if it takes you too long, you might be out of the game. So there is a balance there to be played. So don't react because some content team, some creative team, or some marketing, and we have such cases in our book, shouted, it's the time to be legendary. This is the time to be the heroes. Let's go out and say this. Um, inhibit. Stop. Don't do it. Don't do it as a knee jerk. Make sure you understand the situation. Make sure you create something that is meaningful, practical, tangible, and you can stand behind it fully. Because if you're doing wrong, your brand will suffer. Second, seek assistance. Hire consultants like me. <laughs> but true, as you saw with the analysis of pain and the neuroscientific explanation of empathy, these are not empty words. All these are studied phenomena from psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, biologists, neuroscientists, that they have studied this phenomena and they have found the last 20, 30 years amazing things of how our brain and our body works in these situations. Why not um, taking the, the chance, the, 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 the opportunity to bring these people in and have a much more scientific um, uh, and fact-based approach? So don't try to do it alone, okay? Third, apply the empathy audit. Um, I have developed a methodology. Uh, you can do it yourself as well, but as we said, seek assistance. Uh, I have developed a methodology um, uh, that helps you through all the touch points and the different levels, strategic, uh, tactical, and operational, to do a, a very fast now analysis 
How are you doing with empathy? Is your empathy high, middle or low? Like with A, okay, but of course more strategic. So before you start, do a current situation analysis. Are you ready to do it? Which, which touch point need more empathy and which less? Which part of your portfolio of actions or brands? Maybe you have a portfolio of brands. Maybe you don't react in all of them. You react in something, but in order to take a fact-based decision, you need some, some audit, some analysis of the current situation. Okay. Next one, start small but strong. Um, I chose this picture um, not accidentally, with a purpose, because the steps you will take now will stay there forever. So if you take the wrong step, will stay there forever. But if you take the right step, small one, but strong, you might be able to make a difference. And the last one, be adaptive. This is a I mean, I, may, I started this speech by saying, you know, the crisis is a constant state of mind. We had crisis in 97, in 2001, in 2009, seven to nine, now to, you know, 2020, it's constantly crisis. We, but every crisis is also separate and has its own conditions and, and, and playbook. So we have to be open. We have to, to decrease our, our ego and our, uh, our mindset that we know better and everything. And, uh, and we have to listen. We have to close our eyes and feel, connect with people outside the company, but inside the company, our partners, and make sure that whatever action we take we are always open for criticism and information to be able to navigate correctly through this crisis. So three things. Try to understand the situation better. Try to be positive and have this positive outlook that um, we will survive. And maybe with the right actions, we can, we can end up stronger. And especially when you take action, take action to make things happen. What are these three? Cognitive, understanding, emotional, be positive, and behavioral, make things happen. If we do this, and maybe other things you are doing and they're working, maybe this crisis will not again bring marketeers in a worse possible, in a worse position than before. Maybe it will be good for us. And maybe finally, we will have a positive impact on this world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nikos, for these valuable insights for uh, how marketers should behave in these very uncertain times. Uh, we, have do, we unfortunately do not have much time, but still some comments and uh, questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, a comment from an attendee. You know, a lot of companies in Ukraine support state authorities through a number of initiatives that help to collect money for doctors who got sick, helping other people, and also uh, through purchase of necessary tests. So this is the, uh, and the other way to say, about the brand in a proper way in the current new reality. Correct. And this is uh, when I, I, I showed these um, five main ways that uh, current brands are reacting. Actually, this is, this is one of them. It could be donating, so helping ma uh, money, or producing parts of the equipment. So yes, definitely this is a, a, a valid way, a very yeah. tangible way. Not the only one, but it's definitely a starting one. Yeah, another, com and another comment is that that's why empathy has to be cultivated in school environment. Do you agree? Fantastic. Whoever says this, you get an, an award. Um, there is a study showing that up to six years old, both kids on the West and in the East, Far East, we have, they, they develop the same healthy empathy. But at six years old on the West, in the West, empathy starts dropping. What happens at six years old? Six, seven in some countries, five in some we go to school. How we organize school is designed to diminish, if not kill empathy. We urgently have to change this. Um, there is a very nice NGO from, from Canada called Roots of Empathy that they teach empathy at schools. Take a look at their website. Yeah, and the comment from Constantine, how I went to the airport. <laughs> I guess this is after your, the videos from the airport and airlines. How I went? I didn't hear you. How? How, how I went to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. You know, I, I used to fly two times per week and I'm grounded now for one month. I have to say that this was the best time to reconnect with my family, with my friends. We have to make the most out of... I'm sure when traveling starts, we will be on a plane right away, but... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Buying, buying tickets the, the first day. Yeah. Uh, another question. Um, do you believe that the same way would work with 100 natural ingredients cosmetic company since the customers could produce it by themselves in their kitchen? <laughs> fantastic. You know, fantastic. This is enabling them. 
This is enabling them. And anyway, if you produce something that can be produced in, in the kitchen, you have to reconsider your business model. Um, don't forget that um, products are steps in building a strong brand. Um, maybe you start with something simple, but it's just a starting point. Um, R&D never finishes. With what products you start a company and the way that you use these products to connect with people and enable them is actually fuel to your creativity to create the next product and the next product and the next product. So I think that uh, transparency, enabling them, helping them to grow, helping them to connect are very important, even if this means more effort for us. No more R&D, more, more, uh, more um, time and money spent to create a real difference. That's, that's fine. Yeah, and, my, and maybe the last one is, uh, what do you think will the uh, psychology of the customer will be the, uh, what will be the psychology of customers after the quarantine in the service, in service industry? Um, I'm a big believer of what is called in psychology adaptation. We, we adapt slowly to the crisis. We will immediately adapt back to our old um, habits when the crisis is finished. I'm not holding uh, in too much esteem uh, these people that we say when the crisis finishes, we'll end up in a different world. These people are consultants like me. They want to sell you a new solution. <laughs> okay. So as the previous crisis and all the previous crises, life continued. Of course, there were industries and products that fell some other, that's of course, every big change creates some interruption and uh, new ways, fantastic. But uh, uh, it is much easier to adapt in something that we really liked and we loved, like going back to our previous habits, dealing with the service industry, rather than changing completely because of the crisis. Of course, another important factor is how long this crisis will last. Uh, I think that we are, we are blessed to have digital solutions and to have these digital trans platforms. If you are in a service industry, and I have seen bad examples, unfortunately, uh, companies that were not ready, they were not, and even, even if you didn't have a, a, a business continuity model, let's, let's say you didn't have a business continuity model that enables you to change immediately. You have to put all the collective brains and the outside external in the company to immediately come up with models to help be there for your customers now but practically not fluffy messages okay thank you so much nikos for your valuable recommendations thank it's you so always much. a pleasure to hear you thank you everybody who stayed with us who commented asked questions uh, stay safe and healthy and have a nice day all the best guys stay healthy and safe thank you so much